Good day, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. It's a pleasure. Um, indeed, I will be showing exactly those numbers in my presentation about the work that we've actually done here in Dublin about the potential of shared mobility for the city. Uh, I will focus, however, first on the disruptions we see in our cities today. There are several. Philip already mentioned several of them, and I apologize for, for, for repeating them, but as we are between you and lunch, I can speed up a little bit and, and go above those points where we have the same um, um, points. So the first disruption is data, what we see in cities. Some have called data the oil of the 21st econ century economy. I would say location data is the gold. That has enabled new business models, but it has also created and changed the way people move today in our cities. We see a huge increase of new mobility services that have emerged and allow for seamless car-based transport based on sharing. Not only any more car-based, the slide when I, I did this was a year and a half ago, the first time I used this slide. Now, as Philip mentioned, we have shared bikes, shared scooters, shared motorcycles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we don't know yet where these will take us. Uh, looking at the average life cycle of an e-scooter in, in some of the cities is less than 10 days. So there's still things to be done, but it doesn't mean this is not a solution. These are still part of the ecosystem of mobility in our cities. However, car and ride sharing, all the sharing, uh, uh, ride sharing systems are at the heart of the sharing economy that is taking place today. This disruption is reinforced by our personal preferences and, and values. In the city of Stockholm, only 10% of people of 18 years old have a driver's license. When I was 17, the first thing I wanted to have was a driver's license. I come from Finland with long distances. That would explain part of it. So is Sweden. Today, maybe the values have changed. And actually, when we look at the data for OECD countries, we see a same trend across the countries, including the United States, of the, 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 the declining number of driver's license. Values are changing. Automation, also mentioned by Philip, another disruption. Several companies have announced high autonomy cars coming onto markets in the years to come, maybe around 2030. Self-driving cars may be still far away given some of the challenges, but if these companies do hit their target, if we go for self-driving cars, that means that the children who were born today will not need a driver's license ever. And their children don't even know how to drive a car. So there's this huge disruption, a change in the way we see mobility that is coming up in our societies. Now, these disruptions are reinforced, obviously, by some of the great challenges we've been talking today, climate change. Transport, 23% of the CO2 emissions. We don't see anything happening on that. By 2050, we project CO2 emissions from transport will be 60% higher than today. Even putting in place every single transport policy we have today, we would get to reduction of 30% of those CO2 emissions. That is far, far beyond, be, behind the 1.5 uh, agreement or, or ambition that we have. Congestion is another problem in our cities, reinforcing every day a new cars coming into the street. And if I look at the cars, by the way, also here in Dublin, a lot of them are single occupancy cars. People are driving by themselves. So public transport is an option. It's not, however, available everywhere. It is often crowded, infrequent, and people might need to transfer. And we know that the more transfers people you need to take, actually more likely they're taking a car to their tra trip to work or their leisure purposes. So the starting point of our work was the slide that Philip showed as well, is the fact that a car on average is only used about 50 minutes a day. The rest of the time, it's standing somewhere parked. The fact that we actually accept such an inefficiency does reveal how much we value the convenience we get from the car when we are using it at the moment. But what we looked at, what might happen if you replaced all the cars in the city and even the buses with optimally dispatched shared vehicles? And I have to stress, this is not a transition scenario. We're not saying how you get there. It is the mind-thinking game where you think, what could be the range and scale of an impact if you had that kind of system in place? So we simulate in our model shared taxis, 
type of an Uber pool where you have three, four people sharing a car, sharing a taxi, door-to-door uh, -door service, optimized routes real time, a shared taxi bus, optimized on-demand bus, booking 30 minutes in advance, drops you off 400 meters from your destination, picks you up 400 meters from your origin. Something actually does exist around the world in few cases already. We have done this work I mentioned before. We've done this work for several cities around the world. Uh, Dublin was one of them, and we were very excited to work here because this is a slightly different city from some of the others we looked at. It's sprawl, large area with low density population. Would our results be as interesting as they were some of those more dense cities like Lisbon or Helsinki? Although we did also model Auckland, New Zealand, which is a hugely sprawled city as well. This work was done in close collaboration with the Department for Transport and the National Transport Authority, actually, here in Dublin. So what we did, we simulated every single trip over a day that takes place in the city. And using the real routes that are available uh, and all the real origin destinations. In the greater Dublin area, that's the study area, and I, I apologize if I misspell, it's Dublin, Meath, Kildare, and Wicklow, and I I apologize if it didn't go perfectly fine. This is an area of nearly 7,000 square kilometers, but only 1,000 square kilometer of it has someone living in it or an employment place in it. The rest is empty. There are 1.8 million inhabitants in the region who make 4.6 million trips a day. So we simulated every single one of those trips in our model. 64% of these trips are made by car, mostly single occupancy accounting for around 77% of all the passenger kilometers taking place in the city. The population is dense, obviously, as you know, in Dublin, where the rest of the greater area has towns with relatively small concentrations. So we looked at what would happen if all car and bus trips in the greater Dublin area would be replaced by shared mobility services. And this is what we found. With this kind of system, you could actually deliver the same mobility as before with only 2% of vehicles needed for the city. That shows how much we're underusing our cars. 2%. That means more than 9 out of 10 of vehicles can be removed from our streets. This was very consistent to our other results from Helsinki, Auckland, New Zealand, and other cities we're working with. The differences are due to changes or differences in the starting levels, the congestion, the availability of public transport, etc., etc. What would be the impact on CO2 emissions for full replacement? One third of the CO2 emissions could be removed from, from our transport system by replacing the car driving. A bit less than in the case of Lisbon, Auckland, Helsinki, but still very much uh, uh, align to our findings that sharing, increasing the average occupancy of our vehicles is really one of the solutions we need to look for. This would also mean that if you only need 2% of the vehicles, you don't need parking space in the cities. You can transform that parking space to something more livable in our cities, to parks, to parklets, the beautiful picture that Philip showed in his last slide, to make our cities really more livable. Another benefit, if you wish, of shared mobility is that it actually accelerates clean tech penetration. The vehicles that you have in place still are in much more intense use. They're used all the time. They have a much shorter life cycle, and this causes a rapid fleet renewal and emergence and renewal of new technologies, such as electrification, to the fleet. Today, average cars are, in many countries, more than 10 years old, so the, the, this cycle is really, really slow for new, new technologies. And another very important point, and I can't stress more about that. Philip also talked about that. I'm very glad. I think our messages are very much aligned, which would be not, also nice to fight a little bit. But uh, I think the, the most important thing, why we use car, why we use transport, is for access to our opportunities. That's what we need it for. We need to access our opportunities. In this type of a shared mobility system, the number of people who would have good access to opportunities, whether it's jobs, healthcare, education, would double in the greater Dublin area. Pretty much everyone would have a good access in their, in their uh, lives. But OK, 100% replacement of all cars, buses, that's not a realistic scenario. 
That's sort of a mind thinking that what could be the potential. But what would be a more realistic scenario? We've done the same exercise I mentioned in several cities around the world. We have had several interviews with focus groups, understanding people's preference, understanding what, what makes them share a car, why they use private car. We've done stated preference surveys to, to a huge group of people in five cities. And this is what we found for, for Greater Dublin area. 23% of, of Dubliners would actually be willing and use, or interested in using this type of shared modes. Interesting in this one is that the car trips are only 28%. And if you remember the first slide, people using today car is 64%. So you would significantly reduce trips made by car and also move it to the public transport. One of the differences between the cities that I'm showing here is that in Dublin, people would move from using car to both shared mobility and public transport. Because for the first leg, you don't need that own car anymore. If you can get shared mobility as a feeder service to your mass transit, you actually have a, a, have a very smooth travel to your destination. In New Zealand, Auckland, not surprisingly, car is still the main dominant mode. It's a very sprawl city. Uh, but in Helsinki, on the other hand, 63% of people would be willing to use shared mobility services. The Helsinki is an interesting case, not only because I come originally from Finland, but because in Helsinki, there has been already a system similar to what we have simulated. It's an on-demand shared taxi bus that is called Kutsu Plus, and it was hugely popular. And people have already an experience on what would it mean to have a door-to-door -door type of public transport service. And, and that is really shown in the figures that they really found it valuable and would like to have it keep it going. Um, a couple of more insights about the work we've done on, on shared mobility on these interviews with people. One of the interesting things on every single city was that people prefer to share vehicles with more people than with few. This was counterintuitive to us. I thought people say, I'd like to be there by myself. The reason for when we ask him, what, why, was that, well, if there's a one person in addition to me, I might need to have, have to strike a conversation with that person. But if there are three, four people, I can mind my own business, continue my travel as if it was a public transport, and I don't have to worry about that discussion. Early adapters in most of the cities are people who are living far away from the city center, from the jobs, job locations, who are forced to use the car because there's no other alternative. They would love to use other alternative if, if it was available. Today, many of them use public transport, and with several freak, uh, changes, it becomes complicated to get to your jobs or hobbies. Also, younger people, we've seen that trends that I mentioned in the beginning, and women are also far more willing to use this type of services as men. The interesting thing that came also from many of these studies, is, and is, this is in case of in Dublin, over 24% of the respondents who have a car today would be willing to sell one or more of their cars if the shared mobility service was available. So let's take that 20% as, a, as a, some kind of a realistic mark of replacing 20% of car trips in, in the greater Dublin region and keeping the core bus network. So only replacing the low demand, low frequency bus lanes which are highly expensive to maintain for public transport authorities as well. And huge results. Just with replacing 20%, you can cut the CO2 by 23%. Why the difference? Because these are the trips that are the longest trips. We're only replacing 20%, but these are actually the trips that come from the region to the city center with long distances, with a lot of passenger kilometers. You can also reduce congestion by 10%. Uh, and the fleet by 20%, I said. And this is just to remind, what we modeled here was using current vehicle technologies, a, a combustion engine of, of a car. If this was electrified, this was obviously would bring emissions to close to zero. But the downside of electrification in the size of a region like, like Dublin is that it is big, so you would need additional fleet, quite a large additional fleet at least with the current technologies that we have to charge the batteries. Another thing, and I, I like exactly the Lego picture here, is that we can only look at electrification alone. It's part of the solution. 
Yes, we need to electrify. But, as you also said, electric congestion is still a congestion. So we need to focus on sustainable mobility, providing people an opportunity to access their opportunities with low cost, with low time, and in a clean environment. So it is a combination of, of the measures. So for my final slide, what are the key takeaways from our work on shared mobility more generally? And I have to remind, this is just a one part of a package. I'm focusing deliberately on shared mobility. There are many others that are there that need to be considered. Shared mobility is already becoming a new public transport mode. When people talk about public transport, we typically think of bus or rail. But all the shared systems, shared cars, shared vehicles, shared uh, scooters, they are a part of that public transport offer that we have in our cities. And we recommend to cities and governments to integrate that into your transport offer. Especially use them as a feeder service to increase use of public transport target those people who don't have an opportunity, those who have living farther away from the city center, and target them to feed into the core bus network and rail, and really moving away from car users. At the end of the day, I always get a question in many of the presentations, like what would be the solution, the first solution for you to solve the problem of congestion, solve the problem of climate change? And I always say, if I knew, I wouldn't be probably here, I'd be talking in somewhere else today. But it is quite simple. Increase the average load of every single transport mode. Cars, for passengers, for freight, it's always about the utilization rate of the vehicles we have on our space. So thank you very much, and I'll stop here.